Social Anarchism or Lifestyle Anarchism, An Unbridgeable Chasm, by Murray Bookshin, published by AK Press, 1995. A Note to the Reader This short work was written to deal with the fact that anarchism stands at a turning point in its long and turbulent history. At a time when popular distrust of the state has reached extraordinary proportions in many countries, when the division of society among a handful of opulently wealthy individuals and corporations contrasts sharply with the growing impoverishment of millions of people on a scale unprecedented since the Great Depression decade, when the intensity of exploitation has forced people in growing numbers to accept a work week of a length typical of the last century, anarchists have formed. Neither a coherent program nor a revolutionary organization to provide a direction for the mass discontent that contemporary society is creating. Instead, this discontent is being absorbed by political reactionaries and channeled into hostility toward ethnic minorities, immigrants, and the poor and marginal, such as single mothers, the homeless, the elderly and even environmentalists, who are being depicted as the principal sources of contemporary social problems. The failure of anarchists, or, at least, of many self-styled anarchists, to reach a potentially huge body of supporters stems not only from the sense of powerlessness that permeates millions of people today. It is due in no small measure to the changes that have occurred among many anarchists over the past two decades. Like it or not, thousands of self-styled anarchists have slowly surrendered the social core of anarchist ideas to the all-pervasive yuppie and New Age personalism that marks this decadent, bourgeois effete era. In a very real sense, they are no longer socialists, the advocates of a communally oriented libertarian society, and they issue any serious commitment to an organized, programmatically coherent social confrontation with the existing order. In growing numbers, they have followed the largely middle-class trend of the time into a decadent personalism in the name of their sovereign autonomy, a quasi-mysticism in the name of intuitionism, and a prelapsarian vision of history in the name of primitivism. Indeed, capitalism itself has been mystified by many self-styled anarchists into an abstractly conceived industrial society and the various oppressions that it inflicts upon society have been grossly imputed to the impact of technology not the underlying social relationships between capital and labor, structured around an all-pervasive marketplace economy that has penetrated into every sphere of life, from culture to friendships and family. The tendency of many anarchists to root the ills of society in civilization rather than in capital and hierarchy in the mega-machine rather than in the commodification of life, and in shadowy simulations rather than in the very tangible tyranny of material want and exploitation is not unlike bourgeois apologias for downsizing in modem corporations today as the product of technological advances rather than of the bourgeoisie's insatiable appetite for profit. My emphasis in the pages that follow concerns the steady withdrawal of self-styled anarchists these days from the social domain that formed the principal arena of earlier anarchists, such as anarcho-syndicalists and revolutionary libertarian communists, into episodic adventures that issue any organizational commitment and intellectual coherence, and, more disturbingly, into a crude egotism that feeds on the larger cultural decadence of present-day bourgeois society. Anarchists, to be sure, can justly celebrate the fact that they have long sought complete sexual freedom, the aestheticization of everyday life, and the liberation of humanity from the oppressive psychic constraints that have denied humanity its full sensual as well as intellectual freedom. For my own part, as the author of Desire and Need some thirty years ago, I can only applaud Emma Goldman's demand that she does not want a revolution unless she can dance to it, and, as my wobbly parents once added early in this century one in which they cannot sing. But at the very least, they demanded a revolution, a social revolution, without which these aesthetic and psychological goals could not be achieved for humanity as a whole. And they made this basic revolutionary endeavor central to all their hopes and ideals. Regrettably this revolutionary endeavor, indeed the high-minded idealism and class consciousness on which it rests, is central to fewer and fewer of the self-styled anarchists I encounter today. It is precisely the revolutionary social outlook, so basic to the definition of a social anarchism, with all its theoretical and organization underpinnings, that I wish to recover in the critical examination of lifestyle anarchism that occupies the pages that follow. Unless I am gravely mistaken, as I hope I am, 
the revolutionary and social goals of anarchism are suffering far-reaching erosion to a point where the word anarchy will become part of the chic bourgeois vocabulary of the coming century, naughty, rebellious, insouciant, but deliciously safe. Dated July 12, 1995